I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. I didn't realize this, but often when a baseball player goes up to bat, or a basketball player enters the game, or a salesman enters the meeting... They put on a different persona, a larger than life persona that is so deeply baked into their brains, it actually makes them perform better. So Todd Herman, author of The Alter Ego Effect, is helping me out with something. This applies to everyone, but specifically I wanted him to help me in such a way that it could be applied to all of you. So I'm trying to be the best tournament chess player I've ever been. I was a competitive player when I was younger, and I want to be competitive now and, and even better. It hasn't been always working out as well as I would like. The world's a different place 25 years later. So Todd is helping me achieve my peak performance by helping me find my alter ego that I could bring to those moments when I need peak performance. And you can use the exact same techniques to achieve peak performance in whatever area it is you want to achieve it, whether it's investing or your job or career or a sport or music or writing listen to this podcast and you'll see what i mean like this one is gonna change my life so here's todd herman in the past almost two years since COVID started over 55 million people have filed for unemployment at some point or other in the United States. And obviously with, with only about a little over a hundred million jobs, that's significantly greater than ever before in history. And I think a lot of people, including me, went through the same thing. What do I do now? I don't have the normal routine that I had. Instead of being scared or terrified, which I know many people were, maybe this is also an opportunity to pursue something I love doing or pursue something I loved as a child or pursue something I always thought I would put off until I had stuff saved up or until I retired or whatever, like who knows what it could be. Some people maybe wanted to be a chef. Some people wanted to be a novelist. Some people might've wanted to make videos or play golf or whatever it is. I don't know. And a couple of years ago, I had on a good friend, Todd Herman, who wrote a book called the alter ego effect. He's been a great keynote speaker over the years, including during the pandemic, but he also coaches a lot of like athletes and other high performance experts to be the best they could be in their fields. 
And I remember from the alter ego effect that sometimes, I remember specifically, this was in the first chapter, that sometimes like a baseball player, before they go up to uh, hit, they might imagine themselves to be somebody else. But I used to do this a lot in comedy, like, and Todd's listening to this, before I would go on stage on stand-up comedy, I might imagine I was some great comedian that I admired. And I wouldn't imitate any of their jokes, of course, but it would give me this extra confidence. And, and I remember one time I was pitching a TV show and I called Todd and I said, Todd, I'm really nervous going in to pitch this TV show. What should I do? And he gave me really just great advice. And the advice is always different each time. And I wrote to him again, because like many people, I'm pursuing something that I love doing. And, and some of you know, I'm, I've been playing in chess tournaments again for the first time in 25 years. I was a, a nationally ranked master in, in 1997 and as, as a kid. And, and now I'm, I'm playing in tournaments again. And it's really hard. Like the world has changed in the 25 years I stopped playing. And so I was hoping Todd could tell me a little bit more what to do uh, in that alter ego effect way he has. And uh, Todd, thanks for joining the podcast. <laughs> Yeah. Well, this is going to be a fun one because for everyone that's listening, and this is going to be like a coaching session more than anything else. Yeah. Like we're going to, we're going to build James's alter ego to go out and, uh, and crush the chessboard. Yeah. And it's so interesting. Like I'm a good player and online, I play online for instance, and I, I did my normal techniques when I try to get good at something. I did a plus minus equal, like I hired a chess coach. I have my cohort of equals that I play and, and move up with. And I also give lessons because if you can't explain something simply, then you don't truly understand it. Mm -hmm. I divided it up into micro skills. So I, I'm doing all the things I need to do to kind of what I call to beat the 10,000 hour rule and online I'm doing pretty well, but somehow or other in tournaments, just again, like I said, the world's different. I'm different. And I don't know, I don't quite understand it. And yeah, should I be, uh, sometimes I try your technique. Like I, sometimes I'll go into a tournament thinking, um, the best player here. I'm a, a grandmaster, a top grandmaster, mm -hmm. and they're all afraid to play me. But, you know, the feeling wears off after a few minutes. Yeah. Well, that's the stuff that we'll dive into. To your statement before about, you know, the baseball player that might be going up to the batter's box and he imagines himself as another player. Oftentimes, some of the best alter egos have nothing to do contextually with the sport or the thing that people are actually mm. doing. So one of the ones I talk about in the book was a young guy who imagined himself as Paul Bunyan. And the reason was because, and this is actually what gets into why people end up choosing an alter ego to act through, his biggest sort of psychological defect that he had going on was everyone else had hit puberty but him. So he was shorter and smaller. And so when I hear that, I want to try to put someone inside of the, the beingness of something that is massively larger than life. And this kid, I don't have the exact stat at the top of my head. I think it was 24. He had 24 at bats in a row where he hit home runs. Wow, you know, and what's really amazing about that is when you hit puberty, of course, you grow more muscles and you do get bigger and more powerful and your coordination is better and your focus is better. Yeah. So what do you think happened in his brain when you're telling him to, and I don't know exactly what you told him, but like, that's amazing. Like, because he's competing against people who are definitely bigger than him and, and better. Well, I'll, I'll never forget, like when he, when we had our first call after he came back from a tournament in Georgia, and it was the first time where he ever made this comment. He, so he was always a kid who had a lot of confidence. He was a natural leader as well on his team. And then, um, you know, this adolescence is developing and a lot of his teammates are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And he goes away to this tournament in Georgia and he comes back and he's like, Todd, some of these guys had mustaches. Some of these guys had beards. And in my head, I'm like, ah, now I know why you've been sort of under indexing the last few months. And it's because you keep on looking at other people and other things that you cannot control. Like your end, what you're doing is, is you're giving them a whole bunch of power over you because you're, you're finishing the statement, which is, this guy has a mustache, which means he's better than me, which means he's bigger than me, right? It's the story that he was adding to it. And so, you know, automatically, you know, even kinesiology can, you can do test on this stuff. You can do muscle testing his power, which hadn't left his bat, his power hadn't left. He could still hit a home run. 
but he wasn't able to because there has to be an alignment between the mental, the emotional, and the physical self if you want to compete at your best levels. And so my job was always in the mental and emotional spot. Like I always played it between the six inches of the ears. So what I want to do is instead of me trying to convince you that, oh, those guys don't have it, they're not as big as you or they're not as strong as you, that's really hard to convince people that the self that they have right now actually is good enough. And that gets into a world of therapy, which I am not qualified in doing. I am a peak performance guy. But what I knew from being in the alter ego world and, and, and refining this concept um, almost 20 years ago now and then being the number one guy in the world on it, when I could get you to disassociate from your identity, disassociate from you know, who you think you are and move you into the identity of someone and something else, that's where magic would just happen. And so, you know, to your point about, you know, the hand-eye coordination being stronger or the muscle, you know, being bigger and stronger, he hadn't quite hit that yet. But Paul Bunyan had all of that stuff. That disassociative nature of this concept is what helps people sort of unleash or reveal what their capabilities or capacities actually are. So again, though, was it, it was a not, he pictured himself as Paul Bunyan. You'll have to describe to me the process by which yeah. he did that. But then what I'm amazed at is that, and I know this stuff works, but that really worked. I mean, he yeah. changed his physical abilities. Like you just said you deal with the emotional mental, but you made him hit 24 home runs. Well, I mean, it was so to your statement before about how, you know, you kind of do this, you kind of hype yourself up to, to, to be this, you know, whether it's another grandmaster or, or whatever. Um, it's not even a hyping up. It is a commitment with a strong intention to be this thing, to show up this way. And, and so that's why, you know, I talk about in the book, it's so important to give form and substance to this um, alter ego, to give it a name. It has to have a name. Because the moment we give something a name, it's language is how we create our worlds anyway. So we're, I'm trying to help you create a world in your own mind. And, and for him, you know, it was, well, it was, it was Bunyan. Like that's who he was going up as. And then I, we work on uniforms. I talk about the importance of totems and artifacts. And so he had a sweatband on his wrist and that sweatband, he would flip it when he would go up to go up to to bat and it was the flipping of that because on the other side it had just the name Bunyan on it and he was not allowed to step into that batter's box unless he was completely and fully embodying what it would be like if Bunyan was in there like just to play that out with him and that's what I did was like you know just imagine if you actually are Paul Bunyan someone who is 16 feet tall and there's a kid on the mound who's yeah he's 13 and he's got a mustache but what's, what's really going to go on in the mind of Bunyan? Like, you can't answer this as little Stevie. You got to answer this as Bunyan. I'm interviewing you. You're Paul Bunyan right now. How would Bunyan, like, it would be like, so? So what? So what that, I don't care how, if there's a kid with a mustache. And, and, it was, and it was inviting him into telling himself a different narrative. And once you can get someone to uh, really engage with that idea, I mean, whatever performance restrictors that person had before, they're gone. And it's, and it's not just the kid when the, uh, the 13, 14 year old kid playing baseball. I mean, there's so many stories throughout history that I talk about in the book. Yeah. Well, I mean, a, a typical example now is you might go to a new job where everybody's younger, everybody's the hot young tech person and you're the older wizened mm -hmm. salesperson say, but they don't respect you because they're young and hip and you're older. And I bet you those people have similar issues like in the reverse direction. You name the different contexts, this stuff preys on people's confidence or certainty that they can go and do something everywhere. But in this kid's case still, what percentage do you think his physical performance improved? So probably part of it was just getting back to normal because he was intimidated by the kids with the mustaches. Mm -hmm. But then there must've been extra improvements somehow like, I'll, I'll never forget the text message that I got from his dad because this goes back to about 2009 and his, his dad sent me a text and he said, what did you say to Steve? Steve's not his real name. I'm just using it. So what did you say to Steve? And then in my head, I'm like, oh crap, like is he doing okay? <laughs> um, 
And I was like, well, you know, as you know, like that's always between Steve and I. I'm like, why? What's going on? And he said, uh, and this was the this was the start of his streak. He's like, he had four at bats today, and he hit four home runs. That's not that's the same kid. Like he's like, I'm watching my son. It's the same body in the baseball uniform out there, but I know it's not the same kid because he just looks different to me. And I'm like, okay, well, what about him looks different to you? And he's like, it's just, he looks more, the word he said was he looks more elastic, which when I unpacked that, it was, he's just so relaxed. And I mean, if you know anything about athletics, you know that, you know, elasticity or flexibility is a huge part of power and strength because it's the snap of things. Um, And so he was swinging with a different physical mechanism, which was influenced by the mental and emotional side of himself. Wow. And it's so interesting because I'm almost having, and again, what I'm saying about me specifically probably applies to everybody listening to this to some extent or other, figuring out where your story lies and what Todd's saying and what I'm saying. But my experience is almost like the opposite where in 1997, there were no kids in tournaments, but now because of you know, kids are on computers all the time and, you know, they're, they're the best in the world by far at chess compared to 1997. They weren't. And kids uh, had time during COVID to study. And after the TV show, The Queens, everybody like focused, they spent 10 hours a day. Yeah. So now it's about 50% kids. There were zero kids in 1997 in tournaments. Now it's about 50% kids and they are machines. They're, it seems to me they almost have like no weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And I'm coming in here and I'm, you know, decent player, a strong player, but I don't know. I'm not playing as well as I think I could somehow. So, okay. So, you know, one of the things we talk about in the book, I try to use this Joseph Campbell model of, you know, the hero's journey. And I talk about the ordinary world versus the extraordinary world. And what you're talking about right now is what I'd classify as there's a bunch of story and there could even be facts in that story that are causing you to feel whether it's doubtful or insecure or lacking some sort of confidence in your ability to go and get the result that you want on that uh, gameplay board. And And it might be subconscious a little bit. Like I don't think to myself while I'm playing, oh, I'm feeling unconfident. No, like no one does. Sometimes I'm feeling very confident, but there's something going on in my head. Yeah. But with that, if, if we were to only look at games and sport through the lens of skills and competencies like these kids have unlimited hours in their day because they're not like you they don't have businesses that they run or they don't have podcasts that they got to show up for it and whatnot um but the reality there is a lot more gameplay that is done between the ears that isn't just about your skill set because there's an intimidation factor that i would try to employ if i was you on these kids yeah completely and so I would be, and, and, and we had kind of gone back and forth a little bit about this beforehand, um, I would be employing some of that in the way that we'd be designing the identity of Altature that shows up. And this is what people get wrong about all this. And this is, this is one of the more frustrating things, I think, about the world that we live in. We have these new memes or tropes or ideas that people have engaged with that are just categorically false. One of them is the idea of being authentic. When people hear you and I talk about this, and then by the end of this podcast, hopefully we've built out this alter ego for you. And people go, oh, but isn't that James just acting or James being inauthentic? And it's like, no one that's listening to this podcast authentically knows who they are. It is such a bad idea that people have been throwing around in the world of self-help and personal development for the last 25 years, which has ramped up even that much more the last eight years, there is no one you. I can't put James Altucher underneath some sort of MRI or nuclear telescope and find you-ness. Right. You've got many roles that you play in life. The great power that human beings have is the ability to create the self to create an identity for themselves. Most people are walking around with cloaks or robes of ideas that were given to them when they were kids, when they didn't get to choose who they were. 
None of us got to choose who our parents were. None of us got to choose where we grew up. None of us get to choose maybe the religion that we, you know, were brought underneath when we were growing up. And yet we're still carrying around the beliefs and the ideas and the values of those people that influenced us or those, you know, community groups that we were around when we were young kids. That's not you. You say, well, that's what I've always been. Yeah. Well, how's that working for you? Like, I'm, I'm not, like, I say this all the time. Like, listen, on, on most people's podcasts, because I've done hundreds of them, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be pretty polarizing, not because I'm here to be a jerk to people, but I'm here to challenge the concept of who and what you think you are. And the words that some of us use to describe ourselves are just really clumsy. There is no you. There is no self. There are many versions of you that show up in the context of many roles that you have. And so what I want to do is take a look at if this role is so important to James, let's build that out in the lens or in the vision of how you most want to show up. Yeah, it it makes a lot of sense what you're saying because you're right. I build this whole narrative of who I am and all of it's kind of negative. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. oh, I haven't played in a tournament in 25 years or I'm much older than everybody, not everybody else, but I'm much older than this new cohort that's playing, uh, these kids. Uh, And they've had certain advantages that mathematically they don't have these advantages. I study hard as well, but somehow this story gets built. And, oh, my, my, maybe my skills are, you know, like, like in a, and when I play online, a game goes like 10 minutes maybe, but, or, or faster. But when I play in a tournament, I play two games a day. They're five hours a game in many yeah. cases because I'm a little, I'm actually a little slow. So I'm, I'm usually like the last one or me and whoever I'm playing, like the last ones playing in the hall. And so I'm playing 10 hours a day in some of these. So I build up the story that maybe I'm fatigued, even though I don't really feel fatigued during it. I build this story that I'm rusty and the whole thing, none of it's positive. Yeah. Well, and I mean, so I've got guys in major league baseball where we've purposely designed their pitching style to frustrate the batters at the plate because they are naturally a little bit longer with their pre pitch routine. All I do is say, okay, that's a natural thing that you want to lean yourself towards. Let's add a couple of seconds. Let's make you, now this might be boring to the spectators, but let's add like a couple more seconds because it's really frustrating. And if it gets that guy at the plate out of the game and it gets him not thinking about really what he shouldn't be thinking about, which is really just nothingness, um, then that's just another notch on your side of the teeter-totter that gets to balance out this power a little bit. So for you, it's like, oh man, I got a game against Altucher. This is going to be a long one. Already you're going into the game with an edge because people are prepping themselves for a long game. I would lean into that more. Yeah. So, so, all right. So let's, let's figure this out. Like tell me what, what what are some of the tools at my disposal here? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, so I'm going to talk to the listener now. So when you and I were going back and forth at a time, you, you unpacked already that when it comes to like online gameplay, no issues because a, the games are faster. Um, and so forth. And what I said was, but there's also a, an element of anonymity that's going on there, right? You're behind yeah. the computer screen. No one's seeing you, right? So no one even sees that the guy who's there is a few years older than the, the younger guys that might, you might be playing with. And you don't even know that that person's young yet either, unless maybe they say right. it in their profile name, correct? Yeah, yeah. I have no idea. So all of this other stuff that you're bringing into the equation of a live game doesn't exist in the online game. And some of that is anonymity. So, um, you know, the, the gamer world is ripe with this where I would turn you into, if I was going to prescribe one for you without you giving me any feedback yet, I would probably prescribe a more gamer type identity for you to show up with when you go and you play live hoodie over the head, right? Where you don't, you can just, you're just, head down you're it's like an element of mystery um around you and and bringing a little bit more of a persona to the guy who i'm going to be playing with he's mysterious and he can play for a long time do you think do you think it's uh works against me that on occasion or or certainly what happens is in a, before a game is that you get notified about a half hour earlier of who you're going to play and then you mm-hmm. google the person 
in most cases, you Google them to see if any of their games are available to be seen, which they usually are. And, but with me, of course, when they Google me, they see a lot more. Do you think that works against me? And, or you think it's something, maybe I want to be intimidating. Like I have this persona outside of chess, uh, but I don't know, maybe I should be more anonymous. Well, no, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that. So if there's a bunch of information out there about you, what's great about that is the more information creates doubt. There is, and it's been proven even um, uh, in the book Blink, right? You know, when, uh, when someone comes into an emergency room, a doctor's first reaction or first diagnosis of what's wrong with you is typically the most right diagnosis. And when they get more and more x-rays or more and more information about your ailment, it actually takes them further away from the proper diagnosis. That's so funny you say that, like, because uh, my chess coach, his name's Jesse, Jesse Cry, he noticed this with me is that I keep track of how many minutes I used on each move. And when I've spent the most time, that's when I make the worst move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. sometimes you have to spend time to calculate everything out, but when it's more like a strategic long time, like I'm just trying to figure out what strategy to pursue, the more time I spend, that's what I'm, it's a sign that I'm going to make a bad move. Yeah. Well then, but comparatively, it'd be, it'd be interesting to know what was the first move that you were thinking of playing, but you didn't play. And then what was the move that you did play? Cause, um, mm. you know, there's not as much actionable data information out of just knowing that the more time I take on a strategy move, you know, I end up making the wrong move on, on that. So, okay. So part of this is part of the persona or identity I built into this is in, and just like with the kid you mentioned with Bunyan, he had a, a, a wristband that had yeah. the word Bunyan on it and maybe he had other things. So as part of it is changing what I see when I look in the mirror, essentially. Well, I mean, it, what this employs is, so there's a, a natural occurring phenomenon in human beings called enclosed cognition. Okay. In clothed cognition, I talk about in the book is that we as human beings, if we put on an article of clothing or an item of any sort, and that article of clothing has narrative and story already built around it, we actually enclose our cognitive traits and abilities in whatever that item is. For example, uh, the story I tell in the book is from the Kellogg School of Management. They brought a bunch of students one by one into a room and they gave them the, the Stroop test, which is an eye test that typically tests your color blindness. But what it is, is it's got a bunch of words of colors. So yellow, blue, red, et cetera, except that it's colored in the different color than the word. All right. And, oh, I remember um, this from the book. and because our brains process words faster than colors, what you're supposed to do in a Stroop test is name the color of the of the, of the text that you're seeing. So if I see the word yellow and it's done in orange, I'm supposed to say orange. Anyways, so they do this test and they track all the results and they wanted to see how fast they could do this test and, with, and how many mistakes they would make. Then they brought in a second group of kids and this time they gave a white coat and they told them it was a painter's coat. And then they do the test. They had to put on the painter's coat and then they do the test. Then they bring in a third group and they hand them the exact same white coat, except this time they tell them that it's a doctor's coat and they put on the doctor's coat and they do it. Well, what are the results? Well, the results were that the kids who were wearing the doctor's coat did it in less than half the time and made less than half the mistakes. Why is that? In clothed cognition tells the story of why. And it's because we all think of doctors as being careful, methodical, detailed. It's sort of an overarching good narrative that most people have about, uh, about doctors, right? Or that they're successful as well. You know, some people might have a negative reaction and might disagree, but for the whole, you know, that's, that's pretty standard. Well, the Stroop test, the skills you need to be successful at it is to be careful, methodical, and detailed. So they enclose themselves in the cognitive traits and abilities of a doctor when they put it on. That explains why the same white coat when you were given it and it was, you were told that it was a painter's coat didn't impact the results because they got the same results. The painter's coat kids got the same results as the kids that were just in their plain clothes. Why? Because a painter's coat is creativity, imagination, playfulness, expressiveness. They did another test after that one and this time it was actually a creative test. Well, what happened to the people in the doctor's coat? Same results as the plain clothes and the painter's coat people excelled 
at it. So that's why I'm, I, I talk about in the book the power of a uniform or the power of a totem or an artifact for you to use, not because I want you to dress up necessarily, just because I'm trying to flick the natural occurring phenomenon that live inside of the brain as we can. I'm a peak performance guy. You know, some of this stuff is art, right? Like some of this stuff that we're talking about is a little bit art. Yeah, no, I, 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 it's exciting to think about the possibilities. Yeah, but, but there's also science as to why. That's why, that's why I talk about in the book. I mean, I had to find out the science of why is this one strategy that I've got inside of my peak performance company? And again, like I worked with Real Madrid and helped them build out the performance program, the Danish Olympic team, the South African Springboks, the New York Rangers, you know, PGA professionals all over the world. And then also entrepreneurs and CEOs and leaders. And I'm like, why is this working so much better than some of the other stuff? And it was once I dove into the more scientific side of this, I was like, oh, that makes so much sense as to why this concept works. And it's interesting that the doctor's co combined with the narrative of a painter, which is of course, not only associated with playfulness, but with color, that narrative was important in the percentage gain of improvement. And so yeah. I'm trying to think how would I, so I appreciate the, the, what you're saying about the gamer with the, the hoodie and so on. Yeah. It's like with poker as well. We had discussed previously yeah. and you know, a lot of good poker players have the dark sunglasses and the hoodies so yeah. that you can't read what they're doing. I don't quite know how to construct what would be a strong, narrative uh, around this, you know, in addition to other strategies. This is the part of the process then. Okay. So yeah. when you think of the qualities that you most want to have to help you win in the game of chess in a live environment, especially, what are those? I think aggression. Okay. Uh, combined with don't play tricks. Cause I'm going to catch those and punish you for it. Okay. Combined with my memory is going to be enormous. So you're not going to do anything from memory that I'm not going to have already prepared. Yeah. Uh, you know, cause oh, and in chess, you repair your openings and you memorize, you know, games, maybe yeah. hundreds of games, thousands of games that others have played in these openings. And often a game between two masters or higher, or you're playing through moves that you've seen before. And then somebody deviates at some point. And so I want to express that. Any deviation you do, I'm going to be aware of and will punish you accordingly. Yeah. And once I'm winning, I'm going to win. And if I'm losing, I'm going to trick you. So you have to be extra careful with me. Okay. So that, that summarizes it all. Yeah, that's great. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts are untucked shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to 
to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing. In some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn, but People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Is there any character, a person, thing, fictional, literary, that you're inspired by that sort of shows up that way? 
I mean, in this particular case, I could really only think of chess players because it there is no like like for instance, the Paul Bunyan thing worked well for that kid because Paul Bunyan probably could just walk up to the bat and hit a home run every time. Mm-hmm. But like Einstein wouldn't be able to sit down at a chessboard and beat, you know, a strong player unless he had been mm-hmm. playing for for years. It, 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 IQ really doesn't really have much to do with it. It's it's just this raw aggression combined with ex- like you want to kill the other person, but with such care that he never has an opportunity to kill you. Yeah. Yeah. That's really it. So I guess if I'm trying to bring it out, I got So I, in the chess world, I could think of people, but if I try to bring it outside the domain of chess, it's almost like, a, like a, like a Bruce Lee or, you know, martial art kind of like on the one hand, you expect Bruce, Bruce Lee to punch incredibly hard and, and know the right points to, to punch. On the other hand, also, you know, Bruce Lee's not going to be, if you try to hit Bruce Lee, you're never going to land a punch. Mm -hmm. So that's, I guess there's a comparison there. Yeah. And so I'm going to go a little bit meta. So to the listener, what I'm actually doing, like when I'm talking to someone like James and we're, and we're looking at the, the performance identity that we're choosing to take out into whatever the domain is, I'm looking for a source code of inspiration. That's really what I'm looking for. So you say aggression, you say like there's there's certain words that you were using there like aggression i want to punish you and then if i am losing then i'm going to trick you i go into my own recesses of my own you know story history i think of okay so that sounds a little bit like darth vader i've got the helmet of darth vader people are if you're just listening to the podcast i've got darth vader behind me now that's actually a working darth vader helmet James, because one of my, (laughs) you know, maybe mental game issues. So I'm a dyslexic and I've got ADHD. I always resisted against writing and I love Darth Vader. He's probably my favorite character in the whole Star Wars world. And it's a working Darth Vader helmet. I will put on that helmet and I will write with Darth Vader helmet on. And that, and that resonates with me somewhat like first off with writing. So I write every single day and I always read before I write. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I read great writers. So I feel like their essence in yeah. me when I sit down to write. And again, yeah. I don't mimic them, but I feel like them and I, I'm using kind of ideas, but I stick to the domain. I have a hard time going outside the domain. Although I will tell you one quick story. One time, this was like in the early OOs, I had a uh, business and I was going out of business. It was, it was horrible. I was really scared. And I got all, I, I love Star Wars as well. So I got all these books, like the Tao of Star Wars and how to have the force, like all these dumb yeah. books that were self-published, but were great. And I love them. And I decided, okay, I'm going to, every day I'm a Jedi and I'm just going to surrender to the force mm-hmm. and my business will be safe. I'll do all the actions I need to do. That's yeah. not what the force is about, but I'm going to surrender to, to what's going on around me. And it, I feel it worked. Like my business was saved. And I got, it was a combination of luck and me taking advantage of the luck. And yeah. uh, so, I, so that's the one time I went outside of my domain in this kind of picturing. Sure. And yeah. I mean, and that's, and I mean, that's sort of the art side of life. Like there's a lot of, I mean, for as much as we're a science-based company, um, there's still a lot of things that are unexplained as to why things happen the way that they, way that they do. And I mean, we've got neuroscience researchers that I have, I've, I was the first ever peak performance company, you know, back in 2000 to hire neuroscience researchers to, you know, help us build out the best possible training curriculum to help people with the, the inner game. And there's an art to this, to just to what, your point right there. But the reason why I was talking about the Darth Vader thing is because I put that on and all of my insecurities that I might have about um, my writing style, if I'm truly embodying Darth Vader, the last person who's going to be worried about whether James Altucher likes my writing is Darth Vader. So if I'm (laughs) going to really commit to wearing that helmet, because that's actually something I talk about in the book is that, you know, that phone booth moment or that activation moment, like you've got to really embody it. Like you've got to live it. You got to live Darth Vader. And I would challenge you on the mimicking side of things because Paul McCartney, um, on a recent interview with um, Jason Bateman and Will Arnett and Sean Hayes on the Smart List podcast, talked about, they were asking him about like, man, where do you come up with the inspiration for like, you've got the most number one hits of anybody in history. I don't know whether that's true or not, but you know, that's what they're saying. 
and he said, oh, I'll, I'll tell you, I would sit down and I would read through all of maybe um, uh, Teddy Pendergrass's greatest hits. And then I would, I would want to write a hit just like Teddy. And I would mimic him as much as I can. Now, he said, what people don't get about the mimicking process is I could never be the perfect fake of Teddy because I've got so much of Paul in me. But it was that process of trying to model someone else that allowed me to creatively express myself maybe in a you know, more prolific way than most of the other artists out there. No, that's really true. So like, for instance, let's say I'm just going to make up something like, let's say I read Hemingway before I start writing. Yeah. It's not like I will repeat when I say mimic it. it I'm not, it's not like I would repeat his words, but I would suddenly have a much more minimalist kind of style. Yes. Yeah, right. Shorter paragraphs, smaller words, what, you know, one or two syllables, uh, yeah. uh, that does affect my style a lot in that particular session. So yeah, so that's true. Yeah, so okay, bringing this back to the whole aggressive punishment, you know, and and trickster thing. So I think of like Darth Vader at that. I also think about um, the Punisher himself, like the actual comic mm -hmm. book character, the Punisher. Now, whether you're a comic book lover or not, I yes, mean, I am. This is this is the fun part for me in trying to find okay, where is that other source code? Like, where is that in source of inspiration that you can use for how you're going to show up? and embody a set of certain characteristics like insert source code. And it doesn't have to come from one place either. It can come from many places. I mean, in the book, I talk about my alter ego for when I played football and then college football. It was the composite of Walter Payton, Ronnie Lott, and five Native American warriors with the name Geronimo. Now, a lot of that is all very personal stories to me. I went to Walter Payton's camps um, growing up. Ronnie Lott was one of my favorite football players as well. And I grew up on a ranch in Alberta, Canada, that was when Sitting Bull fled the United States after the Battle of Little Bighorn, and they took refuge on my family's farm and ranch for a little while wow. before they moved off into Saskatchewan. Well, I used to ride around on my horse Cracker Jack as a kid, and I would look for old Native American artifacts. And I always had this deep love of air. So that's my story. So that's why I can't sell someone an alter ego off a shelf. I've got to ask some questions and and find like what's the th like what and because it's that emotional connection that you have to that story in your own head that helps to activate just a different side of you um so that's why it's a yeah. little bit less intellectual even though we're using some you know an intellectual process but at the end of the day there is this magic of i, I mean it could be a doctor that you know it could be your grandmother which by the way is one of the most popular alter egos that people use um for themselves i i, I like this notion of the trickster also yeah you know someone who's a little devious yeah uh because you have to be a little more devious than your opponent in order to win you have to do some something that they all think is bad mm -hmm. that you realize in a tricky way is actually good. Yeah. I'm, I'm simplifying the process of winning a game of chess. Oh, hundred percent. I know. Yeah. Uh, so, so, but so, so a lot of these things resonate with me and including people inside the domain itself, like other great yeah. chess, you know, a great chess player. So how would you combine kind of multiple, like, like the kid you mentioned, he was just Paul Bunyan. It yeah. sounds like. Um, and that sounds like the strongest thing to do is to to completely, and that's what I would do for comedy. I would just listen to one person in the couple hours before I would go on stage just mm -hmm. to get their, almost like my body would like mimic their their motions a little bit. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, so this is, this is exactly what I did when I was first getting into business. I mean, I, I was a, I was an accidental entrepreneur. I wasn't an intentional one. I happened to be. You watched good. videos of me then and uh, decided this is not going to be the, <laughs> the model. I, no, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So I mean, I was accidental. You know, people started asking me to mentor their sons and daughters on the mental game, and I was like, yeah, sure. And then I thought I was going to be doing it for free. Um, and people would say, well, how much do you want to charge? And I said, $75 for three sessions. And that's how I started in 1997 doing this. Wow. Um, and when you're that cheap, you're going to get a lot of clients, by the way, too. But uh, in order for me to grow my business, I needed to, the only thing I knew how to do was speak. I was a 4-H kid, which is like agricultural Boy Scouts. A part of 4-H is you have to do a speech. So it was natural for me to go out and speak. 
but I was so insecure about how young that I looked because I looked like I was 12 talking about mental game stuff. I don't have any letters behind my name. I don't have four best-selling books, which were all these rules I had in my head, kind of like the rules that you're placing in your head as to like what these new kids now are like. You know, I had these rules in my head that if you wanted to be thought of as an authority figure or successful, I had to have letters and I had to have books. But the reality was I was actually pretty good at helping these youngsters. And so in my head, I remembered... Geronimo. And I'm like, wait a second, why don't I go and build an alter ego for in business? And I went and bought a pair of fake non-prescription glasses, right? People know the story in the book. I was doing my reverse Clark Kent or reverse Superman. You know, Superman puts on the glass to become Clark Kent, mild mannered. I was putting on the, the glasses to enclose myself in the traits of Superman. I wanted his decisiveness. And these were all heroes of mine. So Superman and Benjamin Franklin, who was all about beyond the whole man of action thing, a man of reinvention. And then the third one was Joseph Campbell, who was a hero of mine. And his was uh, helping me with my articulation skills. I needed to become better at articulating myself. So that's what, what I'd be doing. If you're going to be looking at a few different people or a few different sources of inspiration, well, what is it about that person that you really like? And that's the attribute that you pull within. Does that make sense? Yes. And so then... Let's say I identify one to three people. Let's say yeah. one person in the domain, two people outside the domain, fictional or not. What do I do then to kind of build them into my consciousness almost? Now what we do is we take those attributes and those traits. And, you know, um, comic books give us the template on how to do this where, you know, what is uh, the artifact, the wardrobe, or the thing that you put on that can embody all of those characteristics. So for me, I would never, like, there was such an intentional act of putting the glasses on. Because these glasses, you know, if anyone who puts on glasses, you know that that arm goes, you know, past your temple and over top of your ear. And it was almost like there was an on-off switch there for me. I yeah. would put on the glasses, and these glasses had the characteristics of decisiveness, of being articulate, and, and confidence, all the three things that I needed, because I didn't have those things. But I'm also attaching them to my heroes. When I'm, when I'm wearing these glasses, I better show up like Superman and Benjamin Franklin and Joseph Campbell. I, I'm not allowed to dishonor their memory by trying to act through them in this moment or in this environment. And it's, that was what I found, James, was the great activator for other people. It was the idea of when you're going to employ someone or something that you have an attachment towards, the final glue that helped everything come together beyond the artifact or the wardrobe or whatever was the idea of not dishonoring the memory of that or dishonoring the identities of them. Like, I'm going to live through this identity. That's super strong. So, so uh, hypothetically, let's say, yeah. okay, I like you do the Darth Vader. Let's say I'm thinking of a Jedi Knight. I, I would yeah. think of some way to physically think to myself, okay, I'm identifying as, yeah, whatever, a Jedi Knight. And then this piece of clothing kind of reminds me that I'm a switching personas now and That's I right. might put it on right before the game or game prep or whatever. And then during the game, it's very important to kind of, you know, almost sort of remind myself that, Hey, I've got to, I've got to honor the code here, the Jedi code mm -hmm. and, or, or whoever it is I'm, I'm modeling. Like this is yep. the sort of thing this person would do. And, and then what else? So, you know, you're, you're in a, you're in a, what's, what's really important as a nuance for you. Cause a lot of people can go, yeah, Todd, I can see myself doing this for like 10 seconds or 15 or 18 seconds, but my golf game is four and a half hours. Like that sounds like it could be exhausting for me to try to like really embody something that might not be natural quite yet. And so that's why it's important. So let's say the, the, with the, with the baseball player, with him flipping over the sweatband, it was, it was like, it was, there was an intentionality of switching into something. So let's say for you, a part of your, you know, wardrobe of the trickster was, you know, a pair of funky glasses, let's just say. So like in between even you playing, if you wanted to sort of reset yourself, you could take off your glasses for a second and then put them back on. 
And it's this, and again, it's like anything. If you want to get good at something, you got to practice it. So mm-hmm. I practiced stepping into Super Richard, which was, you know, the name of my alter ego for, for business. Um, and, and so for you, that would be another thing to, again, reconnect you back to the intentionality of how you want to play right now. And the one thing that can't be lost in this, James, and t- this is really a point for everyone that's listening, the reason that this works so well is there is an attitude. If you're going to execute this properly, there has to be an attitude of playfulness that's with this. Because yeah. playfulness was the one thing, one quality that I found that the most elite athletes had over other people. You know, even in conversations, so Kobe and I um, connected because of the Black Mamba stuff. And um, I was actually on my way up to Newport Beach um, the day that his helicopter crashed because oh my we were gosh. Really taking the alter ego um, training and put it inside of his Mamba Academy. And then I was going to help him unpack his real mental game stuff because his Mamba mentality book didn't do that. It was more of a picture book and a story book of his career. And even Kobe would say that the thing that people didn't get about my mindset was I was playing with you in my own head. Like, like the cat with a mouse type of thing. I knew that my mental game strength was superior to even the elite guys that were out there. Some of them were bigger. Some of them were faster. Some of them did have better skills than me. But in the grand sort of scope of the game, I knew I had them beat. And that's where like, you know, for you, you know, um, there's an element I think of intimidation that could really come into play uh, for you when you sit down. Like if you embodied the identity of a trickster, really there, there, that's intimidating. Like when, when someone knows that you've got a whole freaking bag of tricks up your sleeve, that's an intimidating person to play against. And do they feel that if I'm embodying that? <laughs> they're of course going to feel it. Like, I mean, Mm. that's the trans, that's the transmutation of energy that you get off of another human being in a physical environment is like, I've, I've played in so many different sports in different sort of athletic environments. And, um, there are times when you know that you're going up against someone who absolutely believes that they are superior to you, not in like a cocky way, even, and it can even come across in a relaxed way but you're like, oh, this is going to be a long day. This, this person's going to be tough to, to play against. Yeah. And you know, and it, it, all right. So I should kind of think about who embodies these attributes for me. And again, when it's more than one person, it's you're, like, you're oh, it's like you said. the traits out of that person or uh, and, and of that one. Like, so I like that this person does this. I like that this person, and it's not even... Um, it, and it can be in their mannerisms as well. That's the one thing that you can't lose in this. There's also behavioral mannerisms that you're trying to, um, you know, borrow from other people as well. Yeah. So that's interesting. That's, that's kind of related to what I would do with public speaking or, or comedy, like by looking at watching comedians beforehand, but you called your, your persona super Richard. So it's interesting. It's not like you say you're Ben Franklin. It's just that super Richard has these qualities of ben, Benjamin Franklin and Joseph Campbell and Darth Vader, yeah. that it's, yeah. it's super Richard has, has become this weird combination of, of all three of those. And that's what you're, that's what you're honoring is, is that sup, you're honoring super Richard, who is yeah. this breakdown of these three people. And Richard came from, well, my first name is Richard. It's Richard Todd Herman. I've always okay. gone by Todd. Um, Richard, there was a, there was a practical side of it. Richard just sounded more old. <laughs> than yeah. Todd did. So that's why I did it. Cause I wanted to make myself, you know, sound older. Now I didn't make other people call me super Richard. That was just the name that I would, that, uh, that's who I'm stepping into is, is this person and super obviously coming from Superman, um, as well. Or, you know, the, um, the, the pop, the, the pop singer of today, Halsey, right? So Halsey did an interview a year and a half ago where they were talking about, um, her alter ego, which is Halsey. Her real name is Ashley. Hmm. And if you take a look at an Halsey, it's just an anagram, right? Yeah. Um, but she said, um, me wanting to do this was so far-fetched. And the fact that I changed my name in the process, I think I had foresight to know that being me wasn't enough. 
I had to become somebody completely different. At the time, I felt that Ashley didn't deserve to be famous and successful because she wasn't that special. But if I made Halsey, maybe she could be. It's almost like she's writing a character yeah. and then steps into that character. And so living into that to, character. That's what I have to figure out how to do. Like I feel like when I go to these tournaments, and, and actually this goes full circle to what we, what you even were talking to me about before, is like I'm going to these tournaments as James Altucher. There's no way to avoid that. And then I know they know who I am because sometimes they actually do know who I am and sometimes they Google me and realize and or, mm -hmm. or, or figure out. So there's no way to avoid me yeah. in this, but a little bit I have to somehow. Well, but the joy, I mean, not the joy necessarily, but the fun in that, James, is I would go, they, th the thing I love is they think they know James Altucher, mm. Mm. but they don't know James Altucher. And like I said before, there is such a wealth of information out there about you for someone to sift and sort through it all and come up with a cohesive narrative or a co cohesive plan of attack on you would be very difficult. And then when you show up, because again, they think that they know who you are because they listen to your podcast maybe or whatever. And then you're, and, and then, but the persona or the identity that shows up is different. That's again, it, it starts to grind up the gears in people's heads. Like, wait a second, because expectation is an enemy in performance. The moment you expect something to go a certain way and then it doesn't go that way, that's when the mental game side of someone starts to fall apart. And you can use that as an advantage when you're out there performing. So, so it sounds like the stronger the narrative that you build, yes. the more persistent it's going to be through, for instance, a four hour golf That's game. exactly right. And, and do you remind yourself on purpose during the, let's say you're giving a talk or you're coaching someone who you're, let's say you were coaching Richard Branson and you feel completely intimidated or, or Kobe, you're coaching Kobe. What, what's happening in the middle of that coaching? Like, do you suddenly take a step back and say, I'm like you said, you take your glasses off and put them on again, or what do you do? Yeah. You need to have a reset. You need to have a, a reset ritual. Like all this isn't routine. This is ritual. You and I talked about this on the first podcast, you know, people um, leaning heavily on habits. Of course, habits are fantastic little strings that turn into cables that can help support the performance or the behavior that you want. But the best of the best lean on rituals because rituals is when narrative and storytelling meet the routine or meet the habit. And because we're storytelling and narrative-based animals without the narrative it's weak under pressure so for me yeah what's my reset moment how do i reset myself when these glasses come off i can literally just do it like that and really quickly i can i could reset myself because i've just done this for so many well decades now um but in the moment how do you reset that's why the ability to take off something and put it back on like the sweatband or or the ring or or it could be just, um, uh, I've got a guy who wears an undershirt in um, professional football or in the NFL. And his is just literally because he can't take off his equipment and take off the t-shirt and then put the t-shirt back on and put the equipment back on. But he can tug at it and he can pull because he's, he's using Captain America underneath. He can pull Captain America away and then snap it back. Uh, but but there's a mean it's like it's not you're just doing it what do you mean when you're doing it and it's it's that moment when you connect and you realize oh i am not really acting through captain america's qualities in this moment i'm not allowed to wear this shirt so that's why he pulls it away but then he snaps it back because it's there for a reason hmm. so with the bunion kid he flips the wrist uh band over. What, what does he mean there? Well, he's got now Bunyan staring back at him. And because he went and did exactly what I asked people to do, because he didn't really know much about who Paul Bunyan was. So I challenged him and said, go read up on Paul Bunyan and then come back and talk to me um, tomorrow. 
and he came back and he was super excited. He's like, oh man, you know, he was like, you know, 27 feet tall and he could knock down trees with a single swing of an ax and all this kind of stuff. So I knew in that moment that he was now emotionally engaged in who Paul Bunyan was. And so when he's flipping over that Paul Bunyan name on the back of the sweatband on his or wristband, he's not flipping it over until he's committing to the fact that no, Paul Bunyan is, I, I am him and he is me in this moment. Hmm. Like his qualities, his attributes, his skills are, I've got them. I've got them. And, and again, that goes back to just, that's the power of human storytelling in a, that that's why we get engaged with movies and television shows. Cause we're putting it and we're immersing ourselves into the emotional journey of that hero or even that villain so to speak. Do you, do you write stuff down? Like, do you write down, like, this is what Benjamin Franklin's attributes are that, yes. you know, I'm going to yeah. live by. This is what Darth Vader, this yeah. is the code of the Sith and yeah. I'm going to put it in my pocket. And yeah. Why are the Sith stronger individually than Jedi? <laughs> there's only two <laughs> Sith, but there's like hundreds of Jedi, you know, throughout history. The Sith basically are stronger. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you would just like, so even the Jedi, it's such, um, it's such an amorphous idea that being able to uh, close your attention down onto one of them mm. is so powerful. That's why when, you know, nonprofits say, you know, there's, you know, 1 million starving kids in Ethiopia, the response rate is going to be poor. You know this, you're a phenomenal yeah. writer. But when you say, do you, have you, have you heard about Aphilua? Let me tell you about Ophelia. And Ophelia was actually a young girl that I sponsored in Ghana 30 years ago. And now I'm reading this story through the lens of just one person's experience. So, okay, just forming this into a process for myself now. Yeah. Figure out one to three, whether it's role models or characters or whatever that I want to yeah. kind of live up to, aspire to be, figure out kind of what it is those attributes are, yep. figure out what is the narrative? Why am I those people? Why, what am I going to think? Like, what, how can I justify in some way that I am this person? Like this, the kid justified that when he was turned or the wristband around, he was facing Bunyan, it was transforming him. There was a story behind yep. his transformation in his head. For you, there's, when you're putting the glasses on, you're going from Todd to super Richard. That's right. And you're Clark, you're that Clark Kent, uh, narrative. And, and then it's, uh, uh, you know, a, a practicing that, but really being consistent and persistent with it in those moments where you have to be a peak performer. And two other things. What is the totem, the artifact or the uniform that you have? Like does James Altucher always show up all black? with a black baseball cap on, right? Mm. Or does he wear the black hoodie kind of thing, right? Like, which is a very natural extension of the Sith or, you know, the Vader dumb world, right? And then what's the name? Who is the one that shows up, right? Like everyone thinks it's James Alder. Like when, when I played football, I was a scrawny kid. I ended up getting a bunch of football scholarships, but I was a scrawny kid. I was... Uh, yeah, I was six feet tall, but I was 156 pounds soaking wet. That's not a weight that, you know, works for you very well in the world of, you know, football. But in my head, I loved it because I was like, you think you're playing against Todd Herman, this 156 pound kid, number 17. You have no idea who's running with me, in me and behind me, because it's a whole tribe. And it ended up showing up in the way that I performed. There was one game. There's nothing that says a 156, 156 pound kid should be able to break and crack open a football helmet. I did it twice in one game. It could have been that they were just really terrible helmets, but at the end of the day, all my teammates had the same helmets. But I know I played with a force that was way bigger than what my physical stature sort of was. So what, what if though the way I want to like, for instance, let's say I wear black all the time anyway, but it really does fit the persona to wear all black. Is yeah. it possible to turn the same ritual into a super powered ritual? Uh, or do I, do I have to wear something different? No, you, know, you don't. To... No, you don't. It, what, it, what you need to do is have the one hoodie that you never wear unless you're playing chess. Mm. Right? Right. Um, uh, there's, I mean, there's so many different um, fiction writers that have 
reached out to me since the book has been out saying, oh my God, I never told anyone this, but no one is allowed to sit in my writing chair because I look as my, so their mm. totem and artifact isn't a uniform, it's an actual place. It's an object that they sit in. And they're like, I have this whole ritual in my head that I walk through before I sit down in that chair because that chair is a conduit to a completely different um, universe that I step inside of. Right, and it's not just like superstition. It's like they imbue no. the chair with meaning. Yeah. And the way a, a religious person would review would, yeah. would imbue a religious icon with, with, with meaning. Yeah. Um, it's so so interesting because you know it's funny in one of the games or two of the games i said i was going to wear a tie which is something i never do in my life but it didn't really work yeah i won one game lost the other it did but it did, i didn't really feel it because i'm not really a it didn't really give me any yeah satisfaction or extra edge in my mind because i was wearing a tie if anything i felt less of myself yeah. for wearing a tie so so this, the narrative and the storytelling is very important and, and kind of really researching that and figuring it out. But it sounds yeah. like you naturally knew Darth Vader, Ben Franklin, Superman. and Yeah, I mean, I, I know who my sources of inspiration are. You know, and I've never really had like a role model or sources of inspiration. I've always diversified that maybe too much. Yeah, I know. I think when you, I think when you dig into this more, because you're a naturally creative person, mm -hmm. um, you know, and by the way, it's not lost in me that you wrote a book called Choose Yourself, <laughs> right? which is literally a lot of the language that I would use. Like, I mean, choose yourself, like choose the source of your inspiration, like that you want to show up with out there. So yeah, but when you dig into this more, or what you do is your awareness starts to open up, you end up finding a lot of these other source codes more easily because you're, you're kind of in this realm right now. And it's, and again, like, I just can't reinforce. It's such a fun process. Yeah. I was like, about to say, it's going to be fun doing this, allowing yourself, giving yourself permission. That's right. It's like when you're a kid and you play Dungeons and Dragons. And like, I remember trying to describe it to my dad at the time. I was like 10 years old. It's like, oh, and then I was a ranger and yeah, you know, I was strong and I was saving people and blah, blah, blah. And like, you really feel like you're that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the beautiful part about this. I mean, that was why you said before, I was gonna, I was gonna kind of ping on this. You had said, you know, I really gotta like learn this process. No, you don't. You already know it. You already know it because we've all done it when we were kids. Because it's rooted yeah. in playful uh, play from the ages of uh, a year to seven years of age, right? Mm. Where there is no concept of self yet. Yeah, that's a truism. There is no concept of me. And so what do kids at that age need? Well, we need to develop a lot of skills because, you know, we do. And that's when we develop the most amount of skills is in that time frame. Our brain is actually in what's called the theta brainwave state, which is the, which is the brainwave state of sort of creative imagination. It's also the same brainwave state that you'll find in people that are caught in the zone and the flow state. Like five-year-olds are in that state so often. That's why, you know, you've been a dad and I well, not been, but you are a dad. That's why yeah. like, when we yell at our kids, hey, it's dinner time, we got to yell at them nine times. It's not because they're trying to ignore us. It's because they literally have some of their senses shut down because they're just in play state. And what do we do when we're in our play state of one year to seven years of age? We're a teacher, we're a banker, we play as our favorite sports hero out on the front driveway. And so, and we do that because we know that we have some natural limitations and I'm like, oh, what could I be if I'm Wayne Gretzky or if I'm Michael Jordan or insert the name of whoever the hero is. So that's why I just say like, you know, you know how to do this. Now it's about allowing this to come back into your life. Yeah. And I like the idea of imbuing more than one, you know, because it's interesting. So. Todd, this has been great. I'm going to totally use this and, and let you know how it's going. I appreciate the... Oh, I trust only... that you'll be following up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I know it's a free coaching session. It's why I like having a podcast is that yeah. I can ask you to do this for you free. son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's the trickster. Um, totally. So I appreciate you doing this in front of my listeners as well. And I'm sure this, this, everybody who wants to strive for more, it, this is, I mean, I called you because I knew this is valuable. I mean, you've helped me before yeah. and, you know, I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and, 
and sharing all this with us. I know this is this is what you do. So I'm happy to. You do you do so much good in the world that um, if I can only help magnify that more, I'll, I'm happy to do it. Thank you, Todd, and thanks again. 